this. All right, welcome everyone to tonight's financial aid Q&A session. My name is Erin. I work in the Office of Admissions, um, primarily with students from the Southern Tier in Pennsylvania. So if you have any questions this evening pertaining your application or anything like that, feel free to let me know. But the main focus of this call will be financial aid. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ms. Jen Gary. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, during this or feel free to speak out loud, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay, thanks, Erin. Uh, we're going to be pretty, I'm going to say informal and casual this evening. I, I really just have a few opening um, suggestions for you as you start the financial aid process, just to make sure that everybody's uh, sort of on the right path. And then I'm really going to uh, open it up for questions. So yeah, you can either just um, unmute yourself maybe and ask your question or um, type it into the chat box and hopefully we'll address everybody's questions. Um, okay, so to get started, um, first and foremost, uh, we're heading into um, what I'm gonna call the peak season where you're gonna be filling out those, not only admissions applications for the schools that you are interested in, but you're then gonna follow it up with doing the free application for federal student aid for what would be the 22, 23 um, school year or academic year as we would call it. Any school that you're applying to for admissions, you're gonna do the FAFSA, the reason being uh, if, you, if you just send a school your FAFSA and you never apply for admissions, you're not ever going to get a response. We don't do financial aid packages for students who don't apply to come to our institution. Schools focus on the students who, uh, the applicants who have applied for admissions uh, as an indication that they're interested in attending there. So kind of twofold, admissions application, FAFSA. Um, now, the FAFSA stands for, it's an acronym, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Um, if you have the opportunity, sometimes individual schools will hold what they might call a financial aid night where they perhaps have someone either virtually like this or perhaps uh, we are starting to get back to some uh, in-person uh, situations where they kind of talk about how to fill out the FAFSA form. So. If you have that opportunity in the next couple of weeks or months, uh, I would encourage you to do so. The FAFSA is essentially what I'm gonna call the umbrella application, the common application. And just like in some instances, you can do a common admissions application. Your FAFSA is sort of like that. You fill it out once and you can send it to up to 10 schools at a time. So hopefully that will be sufficient. Uh, if you are considering more than 10 schools or you apply for admissions to more than 10 schools, then at some point after your FAFSA is processed, maybe as you're starting to sift through your schools and you know you are no longer interested in some, then you can add additional schools, okay? But you are limited to up to 10 schools um, at a time. That form goes to each individual. You send it into the federal processor. They basically run the analysis on it. It's called federal methodology. It's the calculation that they use to derive what they call your expected family contribution. And that information is sent to each of the schools that you listed. Once your schools do get that, which um, schools are just starting to get that, then they will respond to you on a certain timetable, basically letting you know what kind of aid you might qualify for at that school. Keep in mind, your eligibility will not necessarily be the same from one school to the next for a variety of reasons. Costs to attend each school can be different. Sources and types of aid that they have available can be different. So you're not gonna get the same kind of financial aid package from every um, single school. So keep that in mind. Um, the free application for federal student aid just became available at the beginning of this month, October. So ideally, moving forward, I would say in the next couple of months, don't, don't panic if you don't do your FAFSA in October. That's the first thing that I'm going to tell you, okay? Yes, you can. But unless you're considering schools that want a very early decision, 
you don't immediately have to do it, okay? Typically, my suggestion to people is if you plan from anywhere from Thanksgiving to Christmas to do it in that window of time, you should be in really good shape. And by that, I mean your FAFSA will have gone into the processor. They've sent it out to the schools. Your schools review it. Typically, most schools don't start responding to you until, for example, here at Niagara, it's after the first of the year. So in the new year, mid-January is typically when we start sending out our first financial aid notifications, and then we just go from there, okay? But if you do your FAFSA within that window of time, you should hear from your schools in plenty of time, probably January, February, March so that you have an opportunity to review that package, ask your questions, zero in on what do I still need to pay the bill there, and make an informed decision by May 1, which is typically the standard admissions date that you have to let schools know whether or not you're going to attend there and pay a deposit to secure your place. So if you kind of go on that timetable, I think you'll be in, in really good shape. Um, and then, I mean, once you do start receiving your packages from your various schools, you basically have to sit down. And the first thing you have to do is know what their costs are, okay? Um, you know, you have to compare apples to apples. We often get people calling us up saying, well, school XYZ is giving me more. How come you're not giving me that? And when we go th through things, we figure out, you know what, this school costs substantially more than Niagara University does. And even though they're giving you more money, by the time you take that off, our offer, which looks lower to you, is actually the better offer. So to make an informed decision, you need to know what's the tuition and fees they're going to charge me. If you're going to live in on-campus housing, what does it cost? Room and board, that's housing and meals. What are they going to charge me for housing and meals? So start out with with your direct costs, those items, subtract off what the school is offering you so that you can truly zero in on what's still left. What do I still need to come up with to pay the bill? Don't get all, uh, I'm gonna say excited about, yes, it's nice to see big numbers and have a school make you a, a large offer, but if you don't know what their costs are, you don't know how far their offer is gonna go. So you gotta go through that little exercise to, to figure out, um, you know, is this truly a, a strong financial aid package, okay? Um, when you do your FAFSA, for anybody who is uh, thinking about New York State schools, when you get to the very end of the FAFSA form, there's going to be a link to New York State so that you can apply for the tuition assistance program. So you want to make sure that you do that because if you're a New York State resident, then you should have New York State make a determination whether you qualify for uh, the tuition assistance program. If by some chance you can't do that, don't panic. You can always go back, uh, not any sooner than three to five days after you do your FAFSA, okay? You can always go back at a later time and initiate the TAP application, but it is very convenient if you just follow all the way through the FAFSA when you get to the confirmation page, it's sort of in the middle of the confirmation page is a link to New York State. Keep in mind with TAP, they only let you designate one New York State school. Unlike the FAFSA where you can list multiple schools to get it, TAP will only calculate your eligibility based on one school at a time. So if some point down the road, the school that you put on your TAP application is not the New York State school that you're going to attend. Just remember, you have to go back in there and do what they call a school code change. You have to update it to the New York State school that you'll actually be attending. Okay. Um, let me see. What else can I tell you? You also want to check with each of your individual schools to see do they use an application beyond the FAFSA form? Do they have what we call an institutional application? Here at Niagara for first time students, we only use the free application for federal student aid. So 
and the TAP application. Outside of that, there isn't anything additional that you need to do to receive an initial financial aid package. You might at some later date, we might ask you for additional information if we are required to, okay? The, the, the processor, there is a process called verification, which basically means if your application, as it goes through the processor, is selected for verification, the school is required to collect documentation to confirm that the information you put on your FAFSA is correct. We don't have to do that for everybody. We only have to do it for people who are selected. But we would tell you that in your initial financial aid package, what other information you might need to do. Okay, so that's not anything you need to worry about um, right now. Uh, let me see, what else can I tell you? That's that's kind of the financial aid process in a nutshell. Now, when you are doing the FAFSA, it does go back two years. So you're going to be using the 2020 tax information for yourself and your parent or whomever, as you read through the instructions on the FAFSA, whosever information you are required to provide. And on that note, I'm going to make this suggestion to you. Before you even do the FAFSA, go out to the FAFSA website and either print out the actual FAFSA. I recommend that because they give you some nice instructions in print that you can read that correspond to each of the questions on the FAFSA so that as you're going through it, if you get stuck on anything, there's a little bit of a reference there that you can read to try and help you figure out how you're supposed to answer that question. There is also online, however, many people don't use it or overlook it. You can, you can click into instructions electronically as well for each question. I think there's either a question mark or a little hourglass, eyeglass that you can click in. Yeah, that if you get struck, stuck and aren't quite sure what to put there, don't forget that the instructions are also available online. Okay, but it's nice if you have the actual FAFSA in front of you. In fact, what I often recommend to people um, is that you print out the FAFSA, you spend an evening filling it out on paper first, so you have all your answers there to all the questions. Now, the questions that are asked of the student are exactly the same ones that are asked of the parent. So when you, again, when you go to do your FAFSA, realize there are different sections. There's a student section, there's a parent section. The questions are identical. Um, so spend a night looking over that FAFSA, seeing what information you need to get together to complete it, and then spend maybe another night, an hour or two, actually filling it out so that you have it all filled out. Any questions that are zero, put zero for the answer. So then when you actually go to the FAFSA website, what you're, what you're really doing is data entry. You are entering your answers to all the questions. The website really isn't designed, yes, you can do it, but it's probably not the most efficient method for you to sit there, read the question and answer it, okay? It's much, it's much more productive if you've already filled out the questions ahead of time and know how you want to respond, okay? Um, and then, so then when you get to the FAFSA, um, the other thing is make sure that you proceed all the way to the very end and that when you click submit, you get a confirmation page um, because that's important. You'll get a confirmation page. It's going to show you the schools that your information was sent to. Now, before you even do the FAFSA, so again, I would recommend you do this before you actually do the FAFSA so that you have a couple of days to play with. Each person, the student applicant, and for a dependent student, at least one parent has to obtain what they call an FSA ID, your Federal Student Aid ID. It's gonna act like your electronic signature when you get to the end where it asks you to sign, okay? So for a dependent student, the student applicant has to get one and at least one parent has to, to get one, okay? Um, so as you create those, print that out or write that down for yourself, 
put it in a folder so you have it all in one common area so that moving forward in the future, you continue to use these and you remember what they are, okay? Because once you create your FSA ID, you can use it for the next four years undergraduate, you can use it into graduate school unless they change the process in the meantime. So it is important that you remember what you made your FSA ID, what you made your password, what you made your, your added security questions, okay? Um, the FAFSA does also have built into it, I think they call it a safe key. At some point in there, you can create a safe key, which basically is like another little password so that if, if you decide, let's say you start your FAFSA and you're not going to continue through to the end, you can save everything. And then when you go back in there, you can just use this safe key. It's kind of up to you if you want to do that or not. Um, Typically what I recommend to people is sort of what I alluded to, do your little bit of prep ahead of time so that when you get in there, you can sit there from beginning to end and do the entire form, get your confirmation sheet and know that you, that you are finished, okay? If you do that, it probably shouldn't take you at the most an hour, okay? So maybe try to give yourself an an hour of uninterrupted time where you and your son and daughter, or if you're the student here now, that you can have one parent sit with you and just do it from, from beginning to end and be done with it. Uh, I think I already mentioned the nice thing is, let's say right now a school is not on your radar, okay? Let's say you put down three, four, five schools and a month from now you decide, I got two more new ones and I'm gonna apply for admissions. Now I wanna send them their FAFSA, my FAFSA. That's relatively easy because you've got those, you, you have your FSA ID, okay? You've got a couple of different methods how you can do it. You have your FSA ID, so you log back in there, you add the new schools, student and parent put their FSA ID in there as signing, you resubmit it, boom, your information is gonna to go to that school, okay? After you do your original FAFSA, um, you should get, oh, and here's something important that I remember. You will get in your email a confirma confirmation and you will also get, I believe, what they call the student aid report, okay? If you're able to, uh, obviously, first and foremost, save that somewhere on your computer where you're going to be able to find it. Or better yet, if you have access to a decent printer, print it out. Okay. Also, when you're doing your FAFSA, you have an opportunity to review all your information before you submit it. So let's say you have a typo or something in there, you can correct it. So review everything. On your student aid report, you're going to see everything you, that you put down. So you can make sure that it all looks good. You can make sure it goes to the schools that you wanted it to. Um, and I believe it's on the upper left-hand corner of the first page, but don't hold me to it. Every student gets what's called a DRN number. So if your other option is to call up a school's financial aid office, give them your DRN number because we don't get it, but it gives us access to then pull your form in electronically, okay? So one of those two methods will work if there's an additional school later on down the road that you want to get your FAFSA. The other thing I wanted to mention to you is when you do the FAFSA, parent and student should not, should not put down the same email address. That gobs things up, okay? Oftentimes, parents thinking they're being helpful have the student use their same email address. You can't do that on the FAFSA. So the student has to have their own separate email address parent has to have their own separate email address. Uh, I guess the other thing, move, deviating a little bit from the FAFSA would be, I would encourage you all, all of you again, um, speaking about emails to be uh, first and foremost, once you make a decision what school you're going to be attending, that you start viewing that institutional email address that you'll be given because oftentimes that is how schools communicate with you, okay? 
which leads me to my next point. You probably also have a high school email address down. If you do, make sure you're paying attention to it, particularly in regards to anything your high school, I'm gonna say counseling office or guidance office. I'm not quite sure what they call themselves anymore, um, but advising office, whoever is helping you in the high school with this college process, they are often the first point of contact from any outside clubs and organizations that might be offering scholarships or grants that you can apply for, okay? Because I'm gonna encourage all of you to tune into that, throw your hand in there for as many as you can. Um, you know, initially it might take a little bit of um, work, but once you do it once, particularly in this day and age of electronics where you can save essays or statements of interest or why you pick a particular major, you can edit and reproduce a new uh, essay relatively quickly on a, on a different topic, copy and paste from things you've already created that it's much easier now to uh, not that it was that difficult before, but it's truly much easier now that you can quickly put together a statement of why you're interested in, you know, being considered for this award or completing that application. Um, because you know what, you, you never know. And if you don't throw your hand in there, uh, who knows what you might be missing out on and any other additional money you can receive is a, is a definite plus, okay? Um, Let me see here. I think I have almost pretty much covered um, all of the questions I wrote down for myself to kind of keep me on track here. So I think at this point, maybe we'll, we'll just open it up for questions. Yeah, that sounds good. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, whether that's financial aid or an admissions question, we'd both be happy to help answer those questions for you. Or feel free to unmute yourself. I have a yourself. question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I am in advanced placement English for my school, and they are doing a dual enrollment thing where they said that um, I think you don't have to take the AP exam, but Hilbert College, you can get credit from there college credit from there um I was wondering if you guys accept those credits so we accept AP credits but it's based on that AP exam that you take so we accept the credits based on the score you get okay. um, so we for most classes it's a three or higher um some science classes require four but generally speaking it's a three or higher for AP classes and then for any college credits you might be taking it's a okay. C or higher okay thank you so you guys wouldn't accept the dual enrollment thing? We'd accept dual enrollment, yes. Um, AP okay, yeah, that's what I was test. wondering. Yeah, yeah, we take, sorry, dual enrollment. I'm in a hotel that's not very comfortable. Um, yes, we accept okay. dual enrollment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention to anybody, um, if you are just getting started with the FAFSA and you haven't initiated anything uh, yet, the first thing you want to do is obtain that, that federal student aid ID that I mentioned. And you can do it by going to the, the website is F as in Frank, S as in Sam, AID dot ED dot GOV. So your first step is to get the FSA ID for, for the two of you, okay? Then once you have that, yes, you can right now go out to the website and, um, and look around. There's a whole slew of information out there. So, you know, um, if you're ever looking for something to do or you're an insomniac, maybe you're up, you know, in the middle of the night, um, there is a, there's a whole lot of information out there. Um, and you can, like I said, you can print out this year's form or last year's form. So if you just want to get a sense of what kind of information it's going to ask for. The other important thing is, that I didn't mention, keep this in mind as well, as you are, basically what the FAFSA is going to collect is um, income, income, both taxable and non-taxable, 
and asset information for the parent and the student, for a dependent student, as well as it's gonna ask for how many people are in your the parent household and how many people will be enrolled uh, in college at least half time. Uh, one of the nice things on the FAFSA is when you get to the section where it's asking about taxable income, meaning you're gonna be looking at your tax returns, it's going to give you the option of using what they call the data retrieval tool. All that simply means is it will link, because we're going back two years to a completed tax returns, uh, completed information from a tax return, it will link to what the IRS has on file and pull those questions in for you. So if it prompts you, do you want to use the data retrieval tool and you know you were a 2020 tax filer, say yes. Okay. Um, and it will pull those right in for you. Um, and, and that will, should anybody be selected for vet, federal verification uh, as part of the process of completing the FAFSA, that by virtue of linking to the IRS, the school can take that information as being accurate, okay? The other questions, yes, you may have to estimate. Um, there, are, um, there are some sources of untaxed income that are not reportable. Mainly if your sole source of income is untaxed social security benefits, that is not reportable on the FAFSA. Um, under the asset section, there are certain ex assets that you do not report on your FAFSA. Number one being your primary residence, the home that you live in is not reported, not that it isn't an asset, but it's not an asset you have to report on your FAFSA form. Other, if you have other real estate and property, yes, those are assets that have to be reported. You also do not report on the FAFSA as an asset Anything that you have accumulated in a retirement account, this is more for the parents who are listening. So for example, let's say you've been putting money in a 401k or a 403b or an IRA for you know 10 years now, the accumulated value of that account does not get reported on your FAFSA. Other things, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, yeah, those are all reportable assets. And again, in the instructions, it does kind of tell you that. I'm sorry, Erin. Oh, no, I was just, I thought you were done. I wanted to see if there were any other questions. Yes. <laughs> I have, I actually have a quick question. Yes, Althea, please go ahead. <laughs> um, so we just finished filling out the FASPA application, the form, and we, I hit the state financial aid form as well. And it said HESC, is that the same as TAP? Yes, that stands for Higher Education Services Corporation in New York State. Yes, that is. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone Any, else? Anything I else? I do. Um, can you repeat the address again to get the ID number? Sure. It's F as in Frank, S as in Sam, a I D, so F S A I D dot E D dot G as in good O V. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the FAFSA, if we're um, interested, I mean, if what do you suggest if we, I think I know the answer, but let me ask it anyway. If mm -hmm. we're pretty sure we're not gonna qualify for financial aid, but we're interested in academic scholarships. Okay, well, sure, sure. Um, I always is, encourage people to do the FAFSA at least the first time for okay. a number of reasons. Some schools won't consider you for 
any of their academic awards unless you do the FAFSA. That's not the case here at Niagara, but some schools are like that. So for that reason, if you wanna be considered for academic money, I would say definitely do it. Two, you might as well find out for certain. And again, not knowing what other schools you might be considering and what their costs are, uh, you never know. Thirdly, if you are potentially interested in pursuing any of the um, federal direct loan programs that might be available to the student, you have to do the FAFSA. So I would say at least do it the first time and see what the outcome is. Yeah, I would recommend that based on when I was a student as well as doing financial aid on uh, your FAFSA for the first year, because you can always reject the federal loans that they offer you, but we always recommend you at least do the FAFSA, find out, and then after that, if you find that it's not beneficial, then it's right. not as necessary to continue, but at least do it the first time, um, because those federal loans are the lowest interest rate of any loans you'll get, so it's really good to at least take a look to see what you have as an option. Mm -hmm. On that note, too, I would also, you know, sort of as a uh, a little bit of a motivator. Keep in mind, if you've never done the FAFSA before, the first time is probably going to be what I'm gonna say the most time consuming. It isn't so much difficult as it is, it does take some time. You've gotta read the questions, you've gotta to respond to all of them, you've gotta review, make sure you submit it. The consolation is next year when you go to do the, uh, let's see, that would be the 23-24 free application for federal student aid, you're going to be doing what's called the renewal application, which is much easier because now you've already created those FSA IDs, you've already done the FAFSA once, so you're already out there in the system, so to speak, so that when you log in, what you're going to see is everything you reported previously and you just make updates. So you just make changes. You're not starting from scratch, so to speak, all over again. Um, you'll see everything that you put down on the 22-23 FAFSA and you just make the appropriate changes. You, you use the link again to the IRS to update the taxable information. Let's say you now are gonna have a, a sibling or another child in school. So you change the number in school from one to two. Uh, you make those kinds of changes. You both, you, you still have those FSA IDs, hopefully. So you sign off on it again with the same FSA ID, submit it and away you go. So the second, you know, after the first year, it gets what I'm gonna call easier uh, from there. Thank you, that was very helpful. So for the FASPA, it's um, the first year there's an original application, which is a lot of legwork. And then the years following thereafter is really just you're updating for a current information and then submitting. Correct. Now, do, do academic scholarships tend to work the same way or does it depend on the school? Um, uh, for example, at NU, if my child applies for an academic scholarship, mm -hmm. Is that a one-time only um, application where then the scholarship is uh, for each year? Do you know what I'm saying? I do, I do. Uh, at Niagara, well, let me back up a little bit. When you submit your initial admissions application, when they respond to you, they will give you an indication where you fall in our tier of merit awards. So you'll kind of know that right out of the gate before you even do your FAFSA, okay? That'll be the first thing we put in your package when we do it, but you'll know right out of the gate. Those are renewable for the entire time that you're here, okay? So yeah, if you get awarded it as a freshman, as long as you continue to be full-time, you'll get it as a sophomore, you'll get it as a junior, you'll get it as a senior, okay? Um, other things in your aid package may or may not change depending upon what you put down on the FAFSA. Typically, if the information you're putting down from one year to the next is relatively similar, then your aid eligibility should remain relatively similar. You know, reasons that it might be different um, could be number one, you go from being 
a full-time student to be a part-time student. That's usually the big one. You maybe were living on campus or in on-campus housing one year and now you're not. That can, you know, let's say you're gonna now live at home. That can change things significantly because you no longer have the cost of on-campus room and board. Um, you know, if you had multiple students in college at one time and now you're down to one, that can sometimes change your eligibility for other programs as well. But um, typically, once you're awarded a merit scholarship, that's what it stays for the duration of your undergraduate degree. Yeah, and you don't need to reapply for it. It automatically renews each year. Anything else I can answer? I have a question. Um, so I'm actually starting in January of 2022. So okay. I am doing the accelerated nursing program. And I'm just okay. curious, like, if I submitted the FAFSA, I did everything, um, mm -hmm. I'm independent of my parents, all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should I just be expecting like someone from the financial aid office to reach out to me? Is it a packet in the mail? Okay. Should I be like, with you guys? If you're coming in this coming January, you're gonna actually do the 21-22 free application for federal student aid. I did that. Okay. Um, you should, assuming you've been accepted, like how long ago did you do the FAFSA? you have any idea? Um, September 29th is when I submitted it after I got accepted. Hmm. I can do I'm this on too. I can I'm, call you guys. I'm, you know, before we're done, maybe shoot Aaron your name, um, and I and and I can follow up on that because you should. I mean, we have started doing packages for January, so you should have gotten something at this point. But yeah, you're going to do the twenty one twenty two, um, and then yeah, you could be doing shortly the 22 23 which would be good for the following the fall of 22 spring of of 23 okay yeah yeah you as far as i know unless they haven't sent us any updates yet from nursing as to who the january group is going to be um as far as i know we were doing we were doing uh packages we have been doing packages for accelerated okay. nurses yes Okay. And thank you. Thank you, Kayla. I wrote down your name and ID number. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. If you can, if you can maybe email that to me um, tomorrow or sometime, and then yeah, I, I can follow up on that and um, get back to you. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a question in the chat. Um, yeah. Did you see that, Jen? I was. Tr I just opened it so I could see the bottom. Do you have any okay. information about how changes in FAFSA coming in 23 regarding families with multiple children in college will be addressed at Niagara for students? Well, as far as I know, there's not any changes to how the federal methodology uh, addresses multiple students in college. Basically, with each additional child that you have in college, what it does is take that expected family contribution that it calculates and basically for one student, it's 100%. For two, it's 50% for each. For three, it's basically a third for each. So normally uh, having multiple children or siblings in college should increase your eligibility. I don't know if that addresses yeah. the question. Yeah, so that, that is actually my understanding of it as of right now, mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, there are some articles out there about changes that are coming. It's it's supposed to be the simplification uh, of the financial aid um, process. There, there's an right. there's an act that's associated with it, um, mm -hmm. and and as part of that, what they're saying is that for families with multiple children in it, at the same time, th that division across the kids will no longer be the way that it's calculated. Mm -hmm. um, and and the reason I ask is is a little bit of a, a a niche reason. I've got one in college now and quadruplets coming in next year. Sure. Uh, so <laughs> we we've yeah. been bank we've been banking on this for a very oh, long time. Well, right. And I'm <laughs> going to say, yeah, whatever change they're they're thinking about me. You know, sometimes when they talk about simplification, they actually make things um, not so simplified. Yeah. You know, 
Um, but, but to my knowledge, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen too many drafts and I don't know, even with all of this, um, you know, what, with everything that's taken place in the last 19 months, how on track they still are with that redesign of the FAFSA and the supposed simplification of the process. So at this point in time, we're just still going with how the federal methodology works at this point. And I would hope that they're going to continue to have some obvious benefit uh, for families uh, that have multiple students in college at, at one time. I think more of that simplification is geared much towards, much more towards being able to uh, provide families with a quick assessment as to whether or not they're going to qualify for the federal Pell Grant, which is just one program that's out there. Um, so I guess time will time will tell what they're gonna what they're gonna roll out uh, with that. But right now, I mean the the twenty two twenty three is already out there, right? Um, and I would think they're gonna have to do something to maintain that, you know, that that division or that benefit. Um, okay. In the case that you just described. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else that I can answer for anybody? If not, um, and Aaron, I'll let you chime in after me. Um, you can certainly, uh, before we're all done here, either send Aaron, um, you know, if, if another question comes to mind after we're done here, get back a hold of Erin and she can forward those questions to, to financial aid. Just leave your, um, um, either an email or a phone number or however you want somebody to follow up with you uh, and we can, we can respond to you. Yeah, probably the best way to reach me is just my email and I'll put it in the chat. It's just Erin Clark at niagara.edu. Very easy to remember. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to send them to me and I can direct them to Jen or to one of your admissions counselors in my department. Um, so if you have any questions, just let us know. All right, thank you so much for joining everyone. Um, this event has been recorded though. So if you would like a copy of it, you can email me and I can send that to you as well.